Hello, everybody. On behalf of the Highland Park Public Library, we'd like to welcome you to Library in Your Living Room. We are pleased to present Shelf Isolation, a weekly mini series about books, culture, and what to read next. I'm Sarah Marie, and this is your Information and Reader Services Department. In this episode, we are excited to share with you what we have been reading, watching, and or listening to during Shelf Isolation. To begin our mini series, I'm going to turn things over to Reader's Roundtable expert and moderator, Michelle. Thanks, Sarah Marie. So, I'm sure you all know I'm in the longest reading drought ever, which is three weeks that I have not even finished a book, but I have just started Simon the Fiddler by Paulette Giles, which everybody talks about and everybody loves her. We all love News of the World, which you, if you have not read, I highly recommend that as well. So I'm crossing my fingers that I will finally finish a book. I'm really hoping. But in the meantime, while I've been working or the few times that I have been driving, I've been really listening to a lot of Janis Joplin music, which is perfect for this time of year. If you're riding in the car, it's really great to be listening to some Janis Joplin while having your windows down. Unfortunately, it's not available on Hoopla or anything like that. I've been listening to it on Spotify, but we have lots of CDs when you come back in the library. I do recommend like one of the essential albums because it has all of her really great music. So if you're just looking for some really great summertime listening, I do highly recommend anything by Janis Joplin. And that's all I've been doing this week, so I'm just going to hand it over to Catherine. Thanks, Michelle, and hi, everyone. The first thing I wanted to share this week is an article I read in The Atlantic, which has been commissioning sort of commencement speeches from famous writers and personalities to the graduates at large who are not able to attend graduations right now. This one struck me because it's called Dear Graduates, I Failed and Failed Until Something Worked by Katie Herzog. And it appealed to me because many people right now are graduating into a recession. I graduated twice into recessions, which was fun. And I liked her message that it's not your job to be super successful. You just keep trying to do the best you can at various things and hopefully something eventually works out, which is much more my life experience and I think is not the message that I ever got as a graduate, but things did turn out okay for me. So I really liked that and I had also just unrelatedly for professional development had watched a webinar by several library directors who talked about ways that they failed and ways to turn failure into a learning experience. And that was also really useful to me. I find it much more helpful to figure out not how to do something great, but how to just keep going incrementally and just, you know, like Katie Herzog, wait for something to work out for you. And I think eventually for most of us, something will work out. And then the other thing that I read that I wanted to share is a book that is not out yet. It's not coming out until July 14th, but you can get ready for it. And it's called The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. This is a horror novel, and it's about a Blackfeet man who has married a white woman. He's about 30 years old now. He's moved away from the reservation where he grew up, and he starts to see an apparition or some sort of haunting, a vision, you know, just something out of the ordinary of an elk or a person with the head of an elk. And it starts to come out that this is related to a hunting trip that he took with some friends where basically things went wrong while they were hunting elk and I don't want to give it away. But it was a really interesting story. I thought that the setting for a horror novel was not one that I had seen before and it took some unexpected twists. I will say for horror, I did not find it particularly scary. That was fine for me because often horror is way too scary for me. Uh, There's a little bit of gore in places but not too specifically described so, so that was all right. But I really recommend this. I hope to read more from Stephen Graham Jones. I think he's got some other stuff out there, but this might be his first novel or close to it. Anyway, so that's The Only Good Indians, which comes out July 14th. And with that, I will turn it over to Stephanie. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I listened again to Red or Dead from Book Riot, the podcast, and it was really good. It was called The Quarantine Doldrums. And the two hosts, it's Katie McLean Horner and Rincey Abraham. Anyway, they were talking about books that they have sitting on their shelf, the to read books. And so it kind of inspired me 
to read something that I've had on my shelf for quite some time. A little bit different. Anyway, it's called <laughs> The Chick and the Dead. And anyway, it is a book by Carla Valentine, and it's set in the United Kingdom. And she is a mortuary technician. And so she talks about basically how she kind of became interested in this. And then also it has a little bit about relationships and things like that. And then she moves on to becoming the curator of actually a Victorian museum on anatomy. And there was something interesting in here that she kind of gives you some pretty good facts about things, the history, how it's different in the United Kingdom versus the United States. What you see on TV is not really what a coroner or a mortuary technician actually does. And so in the United Kingdom, for instance, if you've seen a doctor within two weeks, or if you're in the hospital under a doctor's care and you die, then there's no reason for an autopsy. However, if you pass away in your sleep and you're 100 years old and you haven't seen a doctor in two weeks, then they're going to do an autopsy to find out the cause of death and stuff. So that part was fascinating. And then the other thing, when she takes over as curator of this museum, she tells you like the little history of the different interesting items that are at the museum. And one of the things that she talks about is like the CPR doll that always looks the same every place. It's actually based on the death mask of a woman that was found in the Seine River in France in the 1700s. And so every face is the same on that. And I thought about that and I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. So it's a really good read. It was a bit gruesome and she definitely doesn't leave anything to the imagination for you. So I do recommend it if you like things like that. And then the last thing I did was from my pioneer woman and old cook magazine, I made lasagna, which nobody in the house wanted it, but I made it and it turned out, it looked like that without the yellow pan. But anyway, it turned out really good and actually they were all surprised and they actually ate it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen. Thanks, Stephanie. I finished The Shape of Water by Andrea Camilleri, which was my short mystery that I talked about you know, having begun last week, it was not the kind of a mystery in which you you follow all kinds of questioning and you try to decide for yourself who did it. There was a real surprise ending, I thought, in which the detective, Montabano, came up with his own idea, and then he changed it slightly, and then the book ended. And I thought, well, that's that's interesting if you like that sort of thing, you know, kind of a, not really a beach book, but something manageable in size. I had trouble with keeping the Italian names straight and people's ranks. You know, was this the judge or was this the lawyer or the inspector or the commissary? You know, it was just, it was confusing for me, but this is a popular series, evidently, popular enough so that they've made a TV series in Italy of it. And the DVDs are in many libraries, including ours, at least part of the series. There's 20 books as of this year. And I read the very first one, which is not available as an ebook, but some of the later books are in Libby, you know, available as ebooks. So it was, it was actually, the, the main character is very interesting. You know, we don't find out a whole lot about him, but there are several funny scenes. One in which he's looking around in this abandoned factory and he's got his gun out just in case. And all of a sudden he catches sight of a somebody and he so stop police. And obviously the person has reacted, has seen him. So he fires a few shots. Here's breaking glass. Turns out he's seen himself reflected in a pane of glass that is still left at this factory. And then he just, the book says he laughs uh, violently or uproariously, something like that. And he says to himself, can't tell them at the station about this. You know, that, so that was kind of kind of interesting. There's a few scenes like that. But the other thing I did was to watch uh, three or four episodes of The Killing, American version. And it's kind of, it's interesting. I like it. It's only 45 minute episodes, so easy to sit through. And, you know, holds my interest. I'm trying to figure out who in the Swedish series is the equivalent in the American. What's the name of this person? And it's nice because I know how it ends. I can just sit there and watch the characters you know, reactions to things. And, and I know, at least in the book, the action takes a toll on the main character and I'm watching to see how that's portrayed. So, I don't, you know, I don't need to watch the storyline that closely, but there are some differences. I'm kind of making a note of that. But anyway, so that's 
many more episodes to go. And then I ran out of audiobook to listen to, so I started listening to The Great Influenza by John Barry. And it was not my choice to listen to this. I thought, well, this is not going to be that easy to, to listen to. But I do it on my walks, and I'm sort of captive. And right now, I've, I've heard a few hours in which he talks about the history of the medical field and how little we knew just maybe 200 years ago and how there were so few developments in medicine until relatively recently. And, you know, you didn't need a medical degree to become a doctor and things like that, you know, things that are very surprising. So I'm hoping I can stick with it. I, you know, I would prefer to read this in print, I think, but, you know, for now, this is a good start. So I think next we go to Sarah. Thanks, Karen. So my first recommendation, first 100 words. I always didn't really see the point of these books before I was a parent, but they're great. My kid loves to spend very long amounts of time looking at things that go and pointing at all of them and calling them all cars. <laughs> so this is a great book for introducing more vocabulary to kids. Just fun. <laughs> my second recommendation, speaking of kids' books, this is one I read. This is Lucy Nisley's Stepping Stones. This is her new graphic novel. I've read all of her graphic memoirs. She's been publishing for about 10 years, but this is her first work of fiction that is loosely based on her life. I'd recommend this for probably elementary school age and older, of course. It's the story of a girl whose parents divorce and she goes to live with her mother on a farm in upstate New York. She's from New York City and has to work the farmer's market stand with her new step-siblings. So it was very cute. I read it in like 30 minutes right before we recorded this. And then my third one this week is an audiobook. I listened to American Royals. This is a teen novel. The premise is essentially, what if instead of becoming the first president of the United States, George Washington had become the first king? And then all of his descendants are the kings and eventual queen of America. So the main character, Beatrice, is about to become the first queen of America because they've just changed the law so that it's not only men. So she's in her 20s. It also has the perspective of several of her siblings and siblings' relationships. It's really soap opera-y and fluffy and would be a great beach read. And the sequel, Majesty, comes out in September. So I'm looking forward to that. And I will pass it on to Sarah Murray. Thank you, Sarah. All right, for this week, I am going to be talking about Diana Wayne Jones' Howl's Moving Castle, which is one of my favorite books of all time. So Jones studied English at St. Anne's College in Oxford and attended lectures by both C.S. Lewis and J.R.L. Tolkien, so you kind of know how her writing was influenced. The Harry Potter books are actually often compared to her Christomanchi series, which was published about a decade or so before Rowling's Omnibus. So Jones's prose is just, it's delicate and it's smart and amusing. It's filled with adventure and romance and puzzles. Hell's Moving Castle itself is a fantasy. It has curses and transformations, a missing prince, a young apprentice, concerns, concerned stepmothers and sisters, and Calcifer, who is possibly malevolent, possibly benevolent, also possibly a demon but he powers, steers, and manages the entirety of what is Howell's actual moving castle. I chose to reread this book because it is one of my favorites, but also it was adapted into a film by Studio Ghibli in 2004. Until recently, Ghibli's studios did not allow any digital copies to be made for any of its works, but they are now mostly available everywhere, including HBO Max. For a complete change of pace, I am also going to talk about Alyssa Cole's Reluctant Royal series, which starts with The Princess in Theory. For those of you who do not know Alyssa Cole, but either enjoy romance, fairy tale retellings, as this is a Cinderella adaptation, or books that are well written and funny, I implore you to pick up this author. I would put Cole alongside um, Jasmine Gilroy and Tilia Hibbert, who Sarah talked about previously. In A Princess in Theory, Nalidi Smith is our titular possible princess, and she is very busy living her life and getting things done. 
as a former foster kid, Nalidi is self-reliant and hardworking, which is great because she is not only working multiple jobs, but she's also getting her graduate degree. So when an email proclaiming that she's betrothed to an African prince makes it past her spam filter, she has zero time for it. And that said, now we enter the prince, the sole heir to the throne, and who is now on the trail of his missing betrothed. They meet, and the lady cannot believe that he's a prince, and the prince is kind of into living like a normal person while he gets to know his missing betrothed. The writing is well crafted, the plot is interesting, the chemistry between the two characters is hilarious and irresistible, and everything about this book is good, as well as all of her other writing. So if you want to pick up this book, if you want to pick up this series, or if you want to pick up this writer, I implore you to do all three. And now I will pass it on to Jackie. Thank you, Sarah Marie. So this week I read a memoir about a fascinating woman who graduated from Vanderbilt University in 1977 as the class valedictorian. She attended the University of Oxford on a Marshall Scholarship, which is very similar to a Rhodes Scholarship. And her master's thesis was listed as having the quality of a doctoral thesis. She graduated from Yale Law School. She got her doctorate at Yale. She is now an associate dean and professor at the University of Southern California Law School. She won a genius grant from the MacArthur Foundation. And she is also a schizophrenic. The book is called... The Center Cannot Hold, My Journey Through Madness by Ellen R. Sack. And it's a fascinating book and look at this woman's life and her life with mental illness. She had several times where she had complete psychosis and ended up going into the mental institutions. It's a look at how mental health was handled in the late 70s and early 80s in England versus in the United States. But it's also fascinating her personal journey of denying herself that she had this mental illness and she could survive it. But she had some very good therapists who did actually talk therapy with her, which is contrary to what most people did with people with schizophrenia. But she was able to do that. And it's just a very fascinating book. The Center Cannot Hold, if you'd like to read something about a woman who lived her life as fast as she could with this very great mental illness diagnosis she received. And that's really the only book I've read this week. It's a couple of weeks ago that I've been watching TV series MASH, and I've gotten this first two seasons, and it still holds up after all these years. It's so good. It's so good. The other thing I'd like to mention is a TV show that was on ABC at 9 o'clock on Tuesday night called The Genetic Detective, which is about C.C. Moore, who is a DNA specialist who actually helps adoptees find their birth families using the various genetic DNA databases that are available publicly. And when they found the golden state killer through the DNA analysis, some other police department school case squad says, oh good, this is perfect. Let's try to do this. And she is helping police detectives around the country locate people in the court case. So it was actually a fascinating series. So if you're interested in DNA and that type of thing, go for it. It's very good. So that's all I have for this week. And I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. Thanks, Jackie. So I finished year one, which I mentioned last week, and I really liked it. It was really interesting to see how somebody that doesn't usually write fantasy would then go and do fantasy. And Nora Roberts is like, you can tell she's a very experienced writer because she did her homework and there's certain like the first two paragraphs I'd say you can see that she's like that's a result of her having done her homework and then she kind of is like okay I've got this I'm gonna now make it my own and just watching those structural shifts was really cool the, the actual plot and characters are great too but I I'm a nerd when it comes to writing structural terms so that's what I notice what I read and like just watching the scenes shift back and forth where she's like, okay, I'm in fantasy mode and then characters are interacting. So romance was cool. And it was different than I, what I usually read. So I liked that. And she doesn't do a lot of the stuff that annoys me about fantasy as a genre, probably because it's not her usual wheelhouse, except for spelling magic with a K, but that's my personal little like thing that only I care about. So I've already checked out of Blood and Bone on Libby, and that's what I'm going to be reading next week. And then just as a, 
aside, if you really like Diana Wayne Jones after you read it because Sarah Marie told you to, The Enchanted Forest Chronicles are a great follow-up. They're really funny. It's the same sort of like light, delicate writing, although Patricia C. Reed parodies fantasy a little stronger than I think Jones does, or at least a little more blatantly. And so that it's just a really nice follow-up. So after you read Howl's Moving Castle and the Crestomancy Chronicles, read The Enchanted Forest Chronicles. And with that, now it's Nancy's turn. Thank you, Lisa. As I mentioned last week, I was going to finish this week The Plague by Camus or La Peste, which I did. And it's, it's really fascinating vis-a-vis -vis what's going on right now in the world with quarantines and isolation. Briefly, it's the story of a bubonic plague in the mid 20th century in what was in Algeria in the port of Oran. And Camus, if you're not familiar with him, grew up in Algeria and he grew up in a very poor family having a lot of sympathy for the what he saw as France mistreating the natives of Algeria. And this comes into play in this book, but the bulk of protagonists in this book are French and it's a book about humanity and human bonds and the parallels are striking in the commentaries about how people react to having their daily lives change at first not believing it. And in this story, the quarantine starts in April and lasts through the next February. So it's, it's quite long. One thing, and I'm a little embarrassed to say, it took me a while into the book to catch on to it. There's no woman protagonist. There's six or seven main characters. There's some women that kind of float in and out, his wife, his mother, but they don't play any role whatsoever besides being a helpmate, which is an interesting comment, I think more on the author than anything else, but it is really quite striking the farther you read into the book. Camus started this book when he was a journalist working for underground resistance against the Germans, and he himself said this flavored how he discussed how this bubonic plague progressed as well as his research about former plagues. It's, it's a good read. It's beautifully, beautifully written. The ending's very interesting, the things that happen to various people, but it's really worth the investment, I think, the time, and it's enjoyable. And it's sometimes something veering on a horror story. There's even a mass shooting near the end. But it's, it's, it's interesting, and you'll see so many sentences, so many reactions, so many things happening are parallel to what's happening right now in, in 2020 with this pandemic. So that's all for today. Thanks. And now to Lori. Thanks, Nancy. One thing I told myself I would read when we were told to stay home was Walden by Henry David Thoreau. And I tried to get a book group to do it, but nobody was interested. But anyway, I found recently this book, which I bought when I was in college in Wildness is the Preservation of the World. And it is photos by Elliot Porter, who's a wildlife photographer and excerpts from uh, the writings of Henry David Thoreau. So I've been reading it, you know, usually at night before I go to sleep. And uh, it's very interesting, and it's kind of a little easier than reading the entire, you know, if you have a limited attention span. It's shorter excerpts, and the photos are really lovely. I don't even know if this book is in print anymore because my copy costs $3.95. It's that old. The other thing is, this will give you a little insight into what my children think of my cooking. I got this book for Mother's Day. I'm not going to tell you the title. And I actually made a recipe called, it was salmon with honey and soy. It was delicious. It was really good. I did not use any child labor. I did it all myself. It was very easy. It was delicious. I highly recommend it. There's a lot of swearing in the book, but it's amusing. Anyway, another thing I wanted to mention is that this, this year, for the first time in a long time, we are going to do adult summer reading. And the details will come out when the Highlander comes out. There will be a page dedicated to adult summer reading. And we encourage everyone to participate. It will be an easy sign-up process. When you complete a challenge, you will get entered in a raffle for one of several gift certificates to the bookstall in Winnetka. And the bookstall is an independent bookstore that often partners with us to bring authors into the library, so we're glad to support them somewhat. So just wanted to let you all know a little teaser about that. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Thank you.
All right, that is it for us today, folks. We are available for any comments, questions, or concerns that you may have, and you can reach us online through Facebook at facebook.com slash HP library through our Twitter, which is at HP library or via email at HPPLA at HP library.org. You can also find this information online through our website, which is HP library.org. Our music today was Carefree by Kevin McLeod. You can find more information about this and the titles and TV shows and everything else that we mentioned in the show notes below. Okay, everybody, this is us signing off until we see you next. Stay safe.